Okay, so um, I'm going to go through the uh, paper um, from last Tuesday um, as quickly as I can and try and highlight any of the, the key areas where people have made mistakes. Now, this paper has a lot of show that questions and I have a general rule of thumb. If, if it's a show that question, try and double the, the amount of marks with the amount of lines of work that you're doing. So if we have a look at question one, we have this um, odd looking shape um, consisting of a triangle and um, this uh, sector. So we're trying to show that the perimeter of the shape is 40 centimeters to one significant figure and the angle is uh, of AOB is 1.2 radians. Well, if, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, if this is 1.2 radians, then this is going to be pi minus 1.2 radians. Um, I'm also thinking for the complete um, perimeter, I need to work out um, this length, and I also need to work out this arc length. Okay, so let's start off with the arc length. So if we say AB, that's going to equal um, R theta, okay, which is 1.2 times 7.5, which if you plug in on your calculator is 9, so it's going to be 9 centimetres. And um, our length BC, we can actually, we actually do know this length as well. This is also going to be, oh, not 8.5, sorry. This is going to be the radius again, so this is 7.5 centimetres. So we can use the cosine rule. We can say, if this is our angle A, then this is going to be lowercase a, this is going to be lowercase b, and this is going to be lowercase c. So a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. Okay, so a squared is going to equal 7.5 and 8.5, right, okay, 7.5 squared at 8.5 squared minus 2 times 7.5 times 8.5 times cos of uh, pi minus um, 1.2. Now, because we're working in pi, I've got to make sure my calculator is in radians. And um, if I work this out and square root it, A comes out to be 13.21743535. Uh, but I mean, I'm just going to say dot, 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 to show it carries on going forever. Um, so overall, my perimeter. Um, okay, it's going to equal that 13.2174 dot 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 add 9, but then I've also got to add in um, these two measurements as well, 7.5 and 8.5. which comes to, if I use my calculator quickly, um, um, 37 point, oh no, not 37, I've done 7.5 twice, it's 38 point two one seven four dot dot dot, which equals 40 um, centimeters to one significant figure, which is what we were trying to show. Okay, so let's just check. I've got five marks. How many lines of working do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's not quite the ten I was targeting, but I reckon there's enough there to warrant all the marks. Okay, question two. We have a function 12x over 3x plus 4, and our domain is x is in the reals and it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, if I think about what this graph looks like, if you have a graphical calculator, then life will be a lot easier. Um, but if you don't, you can still sort of think about what's going to happen for these values. Now, 
when it's when x equals zero. So that's the lowest number in our um, domain. We are looking to find our range. Um, so we need to plug in some of these values and see what happens. So when x is zero, um, so let's just say, whoops. So for a, we're going to look at f of zero. And that's going to just be zero because our, our numerator 12x will just become zero and zero divided by anything stays zero. Um, so we already know that actually this isn't quite right because it can also equal um, zero. So on our graph, okay, we know it's passing through at this point. Um, we can also try and sub in lots of other values, or we can start thinking, um, what's this going to look like as, it, as x tends to infinity? Well, as x tends to infinity, this plus 4 is going to become sort of insignificant. If you've got 12 times a billion over 3 times a billion, add 4. That 4 isn't doing that much. It's still important, um, but we can say as x tends to infinity, um, 4x over, oh sorry, not 4x, um, 12x over 3x plus 4 will tend to uh, just 12x over 3x, which tends to 4. In fact, it doesn't tend to 4, it equals 4, that thing does. Okay. So this represents the asymptote we get as x tends to infinity. So we are going to be uh, creating a line along this sort of line. Now it's never going to quite get there because it's an asymptote and, we'll all, and we do still have that plus 4 on our denominator. Um, so this is what our graph is going to look like. Okay, if we did want to carry it on, we would also have a, another horizontal, oh, sorry, a vertical asymptote here, but that's not part of our domain at the moment. So we can just do that. And again, if you have a graphical calculator, then it will just plot it for you straight away. Now, the important thing here is it does not ever equal four. It's getting closer and closer to that asymptote. So our range is going to be between uh, four, but not equal to four and less, uh, sorry, less than 4 and greater than or equal to 0. Now the other thing they've used here is they've used x and that normally represents the domain. So to represent the range I'm going to use f of x. Okay, And so this is what I'd, I'd sort of say. Um, let's just check, explain why Gordon is wrong and find the correct range of um, f. So why is Gordon wrong? So I uh, might write Gordon uh, forgot to include zero, I might say. Um, I might also say can't equal four. Yeah, I mean, you can try and solve it for four if you wanted to. If, you, if you're not convinced, you can say, well, what happens if I do 12x um, over 3x plus 4 equals 4. Well, this is going to be 12x equals 12x plus uh, 16 when you expand it all out. And then you end up with 0 equals 16. It's a sort of paradoxical statement there if you take away 12x from both sides. Um, and it doesn't make sense. So let's have a look at b now. Um, show that the inverse function is 4x over 12 minus 3x and state its range. Okay, This was generally answered quite well, um, but a lot of people forgetting to state its range. Okay, So make sure you read the question carefully. So we start off by uh, st sort of stating our original function with y's instead of x's. So let's say we've got y equals 12x over 3x plus 4. Now, if I multiply both sides uh, through by the denominator, we'd end up with 3xy plus 4y equals 12x. And now I need to try and um, group my x's on one side. So 
let's say 4y equals 12x minus 3xy and therefore um, I can now factorize this so x brackets 12 minus 3y equals 4y and finally dividing through by that bracket 4y over 12 minus 3y equals x. Now when we've got our inverse function we would swip, uh, swip, swatch. We would swap the x's and y's around so the inverse function in terms of x is going to be 4x over 12 minus 3y. Uh, we haven't quite stated the range yet so the range of the inverse if you remember is going to be the same as the domain of our original function and the domain of our original function was um this this thing up here yeah this um x is in the reals and x is greater than or equal to zero so if i'm describing the range I'm, i would say f minus one of x is in the reals and f minus 1 of x is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, let's have a look at C. I think I might need a bit more paper. Okay, so in C, it's asking us to show for x is in the reals and greater than 0 that f of f of x is 9x over 3x plus 1. So again, started well, not finished too well by a few people. Let's have a, a quick look. So remember, f of x was that 12x over 3x plus 4. So f of f of x is going to be when I sub the function into itself. So it's going to be 12 times 12x over 3x plus 4. over 3 times 12x over 3x plus 4 plus 4. Okay. Now if I simplify this out, we're going to have 144x over 3x plus 4 on the top over um, 3 times 12, 36x over 3x plus 4, plus 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times top and bottom by 3x plus 4 over 3x plus 4, just to get rid of those denominators on the fractions, uh, within the fractions. So our top becomes just 144x, and our bottom would become 36x, but I do have to multiply that 4 as well by 3x plus 4, so that's going to be plus 12x, plus 16. Okay, so altogether 144x over 48x plus 16. Now what, let's just have a look. What did it want us to show? It wanted us to show that it, this comes to 9x over 3x plus 1, which would suggest that everything divides by 16 if, if this uh, 16 becomes a 1. And if we look at it a bit more carefully, it does. So we can say um, this, this just simplifies down to uh, 9x over 3x plus 1. Let's just make sure that there's nothing else I need to add in. No, that looks fine to me. And show that uh, f of f of x equals 7 over 2 has no solutions. So, I mean, even if you hadn't done the previous question, you could use its answer. Um, you could use this to set this up and say that 9x over 3x plus 1 is 7 over 2. And if we solve this, multiplying through by uh, 2 and multiplying through by 3x plus 1 uh, is going to yield 21x uh, plus 7. So we have uh, 3x equals minus 7 and x is minus 7 over 3. Now what's the issue with this? Well x has to, according to this, be greater than or equal to 0. So this is why this function breaks down. So we can say um, minus 7 over 3 
is less than zero. Um, and as um, x has to be greater than or equal to zero, um, f of f of x equals um, seven over two has no real solutions. Okay. Okay, question three. Gordon is taking his end of year maths exam and these are his questions. Uh, read the questions that Gordon is asked. You will answer questions about Gordon's answers. So, first up, uh, we've got one of these addition formulae questions where we're combining sine and cos into one trig function. This, in this case, it's sine. Um, so, straight away, uh, we're looking at uh, Gordon's answer. Gordon finds that r equals 5 and uh, alpha is 53.1. Okay, so there are a couple of shortcuts you can use for this. Um, we can use these values because we know this is going to end up as a sort of right angle triangle with sides of 3 and 4. Um, and, we're, and r is always going to be our hypotenuse. So straight away we can show that r is going to be the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which comes out as 5. So I'm, actually, I'm quite happy with Gordon's r value. Um, if I did want to um, put it into um, the addition formulae, and you were even given the addition formulae here, you were told that sine of a minus b equals uh, sine uh, a, in fact, it's, it's going to be sine a cos b minus cos a sine b, okay? Um, so we can replace a with theta, okay? And we are trying to find the value of b in this case, or alpha. And if I swap the b's out for, um, what's going on there? If I swap the b's out for uh, alphas, which it is in this question, okay. Um, and I know that it's going to be r sine of all of this, so we can say this is going to be r and r. Um, I can say things like um, r cos alpha must equal um, this 3 and r sine alpha has to equal 4. Okay, I mean you can you can also use this to work out r. Uh, this is where the the triangle sort of comes from, um, or we can say that tan alpha, so um, this one divided by this one, is going to equal four over three, and this gives us alpha as um, what does it come to? Let's just have a quick look on my calculator. This comes to 53.13 dot 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 dot. In fact, shift turn 4 over 3. You get a few more, you get 0, 1 dot 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 dot. Um, so this actually looks good with Gordon's answer. But um, let's just read the question again. It says, state the value of r and give the value of alpha to two decimal places. So alpha is 53.13. So the mistake Gordon made was Gordon only rounded to one dp. Okay, so let's have a look at b. In fact, it's not b, it's um, part two, isn't it? So, for bi, Gordon incorrectly answers that the maximum temperature is 12 degrees. So, if we rewrite g here, g is going to equal 17, and I can use what we've already done 
to say this is going to be plus 5 times sine of uh, 15t uh, minus that 53.13. Okay, now the maximum and minimum value of sine has to be between minus 1 and 1. So the maximum this is going to be is 17 plus 5 times 1. And the minimum it would be is 17 add 5 times minus 1. So it looks like Gordon's times it by minus 1 for some reason. So maybe he read this as minimum rather than maximum. So our max is going to be 17 plus 5 times 1 which is 22. So Gordon found the minimum. Okay. Each of these questions is asking us to explain the mistake that Gordon made. So it's important that we are answering that part of the question. And for part three, for B part two, Gordon answers at the time after midday when the temperature in the, in the greenhouse is 20 degrees is 605. Show that Gordon is correct. Okay. So this one was not answered well. So we need to have a look at um, the question. Um, let's just read this in a bit more detail. So it's in terms of T, and T is the time in hours after 5 a.m. Now that's going to be important. So when we solve this, we are looking at when G is 20. So 20 equals 17 plus sine, in fact, 5 sine of theta minus 53.13. So 3 over uh, 5 equals sine of theta minus 53.13. And if we inverse sine of 3 over 5, I get a value of 36. So sine, and actually I'm not going to use theta, I'm going to use the, the unit that's given in the question, 15t. So sine of 15, whoops, no. I'm, I'm doing sine so I can just say that 15t minus 53.13 equals uh, this 36.86. Nine eight nine seven six five dot 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 dot. Um, but are those? Is that the only one? I mean, it is asking for the first time um, after midday. Now we are looking and at our sort of information. And it says that T is the time after five a.m. So if T comes out to be anything less than seven, this isn't going to be after midday. So if I solve this um, normally, so 15t uh, equals, let's just add 53.13 um, hopefully you'd be using your, you know, the, the exact answers, uh, it comes to 89.99, in fact, and so on. In fact, does it actually, let's, Let's store this way. So if I do shift tan uh, of four thirds and store this, okay, and then I do shift sine of three fifths and add my previous value. It does actually give me exactly 90 degrees. And so T comes out to be exactly six. Now this would relate to a time of 5 a.m. plus six hours, which is only 11 a.m. So this does not work. What I should have really done is list all the possible values um, that um, 5t minus 53.13 could equal at the beginning. 
So the next value along is going to be um, 180 minus this 36.86 dot 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 dot. Okay. Um, so 180 minus is going to be 143.1301 dot 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 dot. Um, and if I use that one, so 15t minus 53.13 equals 143.1301 and add uh, this, I get 15t equals 196.26 okay um, and therefore t divide by 15 is 13.084 dot 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 now um, this 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 works because uh, if we start at 5 a.m. we're adding 13 hours and it also works because in our question we're told that t has to be between 0 and 17 so it still satisfies that um, so how many hours is this going to be well you, you have a button on your calculator which it, which converts to hours minutes and seconds um, this is going to be 13 hours and five minutes and uh, 2.45 seconds from the looks of it um, so uh, from 5 a.m this is going to become 6.05 p.m. Okay. Okay, question four. So we're being asked to show that sine x over 1 minus cos x um, plus 1 minus cos x over sine x is something times cosec x. So let's have a look at uh, combining it into one fraction. Uh, we would multiply the fraction on the left by sine x. So 1 minus cos x times sine x. And our numerator would now become sine squared x. And our second fraction, uh, if we wanted this to be have the same denominator, we'd have to times it by 1 minus cos x. Okay, and therefore our numerator would become 1 minus cos x times 1 minus cos x. Okay, so combining this all into one fraction, in fact, I'm going to do two steps in one here. I'm going to leave it um, factorized though, just because um, it might come in handy a little later. Okay, and this will end up with sine squared x. Um, plus 1 minus 2 cos x and plus cos squared x. Now again remember this is a show that question and it's worth four marks so it does require a fair amount of working. Um, in fact what I am going to do I'm just going to shift this up a little bit. Um, but this does result in sine squared x add cos squared x. So I want to emphasize that I'm using this. Um, add 1 minus 2 cos x. Okay. Over our denominator of 1 minus cos x times sine x. So uh, sine squared plus cos squared is going to equal 1 plus 1 minus 2 cos x. You might feel that this is pointless writing it out over and over again, but this is what the questions are asking you to do. It's trying to explain um, what's going on. So baby steps. Okay, which is 2 uh, minus 2 cos x over 1 minus cos x times sine x. And then our numerator can be factorized 1, sorry, 2 times 1 minus cos x over uh, 1 minus cos x 
times sine x, and this equals uh, 2 over sine x because the 1 minus cos x's will cancel. So this equals 2 cosec x. So therefore k equals 2. So how many lines of working do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 lines for 4 marks. I'm quite happy with that. Okay, B, explain why the equation, uh, what we had above equals 1.6, has no real solutions. It's just worth the one mark. So 2 uh, cosec x equals 1.6 uh, will result in cosec x equaling... Um, 1.6 divided by 2 4 fifths and if we think about the cosec graph okay it's something like this isn't it where it doesn't hit between minus 1 and 1 the other approach which a lot of you took which is just as valid is to um, well I mean so first I'm going to say that uh, cosec um, cannot equal uh, a value uh, between minus 1 and 1. There's probably another way I could have written it which would have been math more mathematically pleasing but that's also fine. A lot of you also went for the uh, sine approach to say that sine x is 5 over 4 and um, sine x cannot be greater than 1 which is just as valid um, either of these would be fine okay question 5 we have a figure of a bowl okay um, initially the bowl is empty water begins to flow into the bowl at time t seconds after the water begins to flow into the bowl the height of the water is h and the volume of the water v centimeters cubed is modeled with uh, this equation show that according oh wait and the water flows into the bowl at a constant rate of 80 pi so there's a couple of keywords here centimeters cubed per second now rate is always is a key word to do with time we can also actually use the units here so centimeters cubed is volume so this is going to be dv over and then we s is uh, time so dv by dt we can read off as 80 pi straight away um, show that according to the model it takes 36 seconds to fill the bowl with water from an from empty to a height of uh, 24 centimeters so first we need to work out what the volume is um, the volume is going to be off uh, to get a height of 24 it's going to be 4 pi times 24 times 24 plus 6 and if I type in on my calculator 4 pi times 24 times that's going to be 30 I get 2880 pi okay now if it's flowing in at a constant rate of 80 pi centimeters cubed per second um, time is going to be this volume divided by 80 pi which comes out to be 36 okay show that according to the model the rate of change of the height so again rate of change is going to be a differential equation of the height of the water um, so we're looking at dh by dt okay at t equals 8 is exactly uh, 10 over 13 centimeters uh, per, centi per, per second so again the unit gives this away it's just centimeters it's not centimeters cubed per second so it's height over time so this is what I'm trying to find now I've 
already mentioned above that we have dv by dt. So what I need to do is I need to times that by uh, dh by dv. Okay. Now, I do have a formula for v in terms of h. So that's going to link um, this equation up. Okay. Um, so unfortunately for us, it's v in terms of h, but that's fine. We can just flip the fraction after we work it out. dv, in fact, let's just neaten up our formula for v first. So v is um, 4 pi h squared. Uh, plus 24 pi h. Okay, so dv by dh is going to be uh, 8 pi h plus 24 pi. Okay, so overall dh by dv is going to be 1 over this 8 pi h plus 24 pi. Let's just extend that fraction. And separately, I'm just going to remind everyone that I know that dv by dt is 80 pi. Okay, so dh by dt is going to be 80 pi times 1 over 8 pi h plus 24. Now the issue is I don't know what h is, so I now need to work that out. But I do have a formula. Um, we have the information that t is 8. Okay, so I need to use that to work out... Um, what the height is. Okay, so if t is eight, I know that I well I can I can times this by um, eighty pi. So eight times eighty pi to get so volume, so 640 pi, which was done by 8 times 80 pi. And then I can plug it into our equation for v. So v, which is now 640 pi, is going to equal um, 4 pi h squared plus 24 pi h. And this is now a quadratic, um, something that I can divide through by 4 pi, which might make it a little bit easier. Um, so h squared plus 6 h and 640 divided by 4 is 160. So I have 0 equals h squared uh, plus 6 h. Um, minus 160. Uh, now this factorizes quite nicely because it's 10 times 16. So h plus 16 h minus 10 will work. So h equals minus 16 or 10. Now I can discount this and I'm going to show I'm discounting this um, as it can't be negative. So this is our selected option. Okay, so now I can start subbing things in. Um, so what was my formula earlier? Um, dh by dt is 80 pi times 1 over, and this time I'm going to write 8 pi times 10, add 24, which comes to 80 pi over 80 pi plus 24. Which, which question are we on? We're on question five. 
which comes to that plus 24 pi, isn't it? Yeah, plus 24 pi. Um, so this is 80 pi over um, 104 pi. Now the pi's will cancel and the 80 and the 4 will also cancel to give you uh, 10 over 13, which is what we needed to show. Okay, question 6. Okay, we've got one of the, the standards here. Show that uh, when we differentiate a to the x, it becomes a to the x lin a. Okay, so the, the way we go about this is taking logs. If we say y equals a to the x, we can rewrite this as uh, lin y equals lin of a to the x. Or we could say that using the power rule, this is x lin a. Now if I differentiate implicitly, uh, this will become 1 over y dy by dx equals, now this is x times lin a. Now lin a is just a number. A is a, not a variable, it's just a constant. So lin a is a constant as well, which means when I differentiate it, I differentiate it in the same way that 3x goes to 3. x times lin a is just going to go to lin a. And multiplying both sides through by y now, times lin a. And what was y at the beginning? Well, y was a to the x. So dy by dx equals a to the x lin a, which is what we needed to show. Okay, happy with that. Two marks, it's to show you that question. I've got more than four there, so I'm happy with that. Let's have a look at b. Um, given that x equals 2 tan y, show that dy by dx is k over 4 plus x squared. So let's start by differentiating this with respect to y. So this is going to be dx by dy. It's going to be 2 sec squared y. Okay. Now, at the moment, we want our answer to be in terms of just x. There's no trig involved. Um, so we need to do something about this sec squared to maybe rewrite it in terms of x. So I'm starting to think, well, how can I rewrite this so that it's just in terms of x or tan y? Well, I know one of the identities is sec squared. Uh, y is going to equal 1 plus tan squared y. And if you're not sure where these come from, I always start from sine plus cos equals 1, sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. How do we get sec squared? Well, I divide through by cos squared. Okay, so this is um, tan, this is 1, and this would become sec squared. Okay, um, so if I, if I know this, I also know uh, x over 2 is going to equal tan y. So x over 4, or x squared over 4, is going to equal tan squared y, isn't it? So sec squared is going to equal if, um, sec squared y is going to equal 1 plus x squared over 4. Okay, I know we, we like it to be in one column normally, but for this one, this is sort of side working for me. Um, so I can say dx by dy is going to equal 2 times 1 plus um, x squared over 4. Okay. Um, and if I expand this out, dx by dy is 2 plus uh, x squared over 2. Okay, now we're nearly there. Let's turn it into dy by dx. This is going to be 1 over 2 plus 
x squared over 2. Again, I've got a fraction on my denominator, so I'm just going to times top and bottom by that denominator um, to leave myself with 2 over 4 plus x squared. Okay, let's just check that's in the form uh, we, we needed. Okay, so yeah, k over 4 plus x squared. So k equals 2. All right, question 7. Um, using the small angles, and they're even given to you here. Uh, no sort of trick questions about this one. Cos theta will become 1 minus theta squared over 2. Sine of a half theta is just going to become a half theta. So this will be minus theta over 2. And 2 tan theta will become uh, 2 times theta. And is it plus? Yes, it's plus. And we're told that that equals 11 over 10. Okay, so multiplying both sides by 10, we have 10 minus 5 theta squared minus 5 theta uh, plus 20 theta equals 11. And collecting terms all on one side, did we want theta to become positive? Yeah, so theta squared becomes positive. So we can say 0 equals 5 theta squared. Um, we've got 15 theta altogether there, so minus 15 theta. Is this what I was after? Yep. Yeah. And then 11 minus 1, sorry, 11 minus 10 is 1, so plus 1. Okay. Again, there's three marks on offer there. Um, I know I've only done three lines, but I'm not really sure what else I could have done other than maybe put in another line here of working. Um, okay. Um, the solutions to the equation um, are 0 0.068 and 2.932 correct to 3dp. Comment on the validity of each of these values as, appro as approximate solutions to the equation in 1. Okay, well, whenever we're doing small angle approximations, um, one of the key things is that we are always going in radians. Now, this is very close to pi. Um, so that's not small at all, um, whereas this is quite small. So we might say, um, so this is A, and say for B, I might say 0 0.068 is valid as it's uh, small, um, whereas 2.9, what was it, 2.932, not valid as it is not small. And that's all we needed to write, really. You could have subbed those values in and shown that it didn't work for the large value uh, in our original equation. This one here. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's probably a nice way of doing it. Right, question eight. Given that uh, this curve has a stationary point at P where X is 3, show that K is minus 8. So stationary points are all about differentiation. So we're looking at dy by dx. So dy by dx in this case is going to be 2x uh, plus K. The 14 will just disappear. And um, this I can rewrite as 8 x minus 5 to the minus 1. So times by the power becomes plus um, and take away 1 from the power. So this is going to be 8 um, x minus 5 to the minus 2. Or if we wanted to write it out as a whole, uh, plus k plus 8 over x minus 5 squared. Okay, now we're told it's that when x is 3, we've got a stationary point. So that's when dy by dx equals 0. So 0 is going to be 2 times 3 plus k plus 8 over uh, minus 2 squared. 
So this is 6 plus k um, uh, plus 8 over 4, which is 2. So 0 equals 6 plus k plus 2. So k comes out to be minus 8, which is what we needed to show. Determine the nature of the stationary point and give your reason for your answer. So determining nature means we have to differentiate again. So d2y by dx squared. Now that is going to equal 2. Um, and again, times by the power, so minus 16. Um, x minus 5 to the minus 3. Okay, and at, what are we, um, at this stationary point, we're looking at when uh, x is 3. So at x equals 3, we can say d2y by dx squared equals 2 minus 16 over, um, what's that going to be? Uh, again, minus 2 to the minus 3. If I sub that in on my calculator, 2 minus 16 over brackets minus 2 cubed, that's 4, which is greater than 0, which therefore means we have a minimum. Okay. Let's have a look at C. Now, C is talking about show that the curve has a point of inflection where x equals 7. Now, points of inflection appear when our second derivative equals 0, but we need to do a little bit more than that because we can have minimums and maximums there as well. So, um, first let's look at when uh, our d2y by dx squared equals 0. Um, so, this is going to be 0 equals 2 minus 16 over um, x minus 5 cubed. So if I multiply everything by x minus 5 cubed, um, I'll have 2 times x minus 5 cubed minus 16 equals 0. I can divide both sides by 2 and add the 16 over to the other side. So this would end up with 8 equals x minus 5 cubed. So x minus 5 is going to equal 2 if I cube root both sides, and therefore x equals 7. So I've shown that there is x equals 7 when uh, d2y by dx squared equals 0. I do also need to show that this is a point of inflection. So let's have a look at some values either side. So if I go for 7 point, I don't know, 0, 5, and sub it in, and if I go for um, 6.95, let's say, um, and let's have a look at what d2y by dx squared is at these points, say. So I'll say at x equals this, d2y by dx squared, and I'm just going to um, sub these values in now. Okay, so, uh, 2 minus 16 over brackets, uh, 7.05 minus 5 cubed. And that comes out to be um, 0 0.1428 dot 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 dot. And we can do a similar thing. at x equals 6.95. So I'm just going to edit my equation. So it's 6.95 instead. And I get a negative value. So d2y by dx squared equals minus 0 0.158. Okay, so we can conclude change of sine and continuous 
therefore the point of inflection okay and finally part d explain the error in jane's reasoning so what's she done the curve passes through 4.5 uh, 14.25 and 5.5 and uh, 15 point, minus 15.75. Jane uses this information to write down the following as there is a change of sign and the curve cuts the x axis in the interval 4.5, 5.5. Um, yeah, yeah, as there's a change of sign, she's saying the curve cuts the x axis at this point. Um, however, it's not continuous in this value, and that's because. When x is 5, okay, this stops working, okay? So we need to allude to that. So at x equals 5, um, the curve is not continuous, okay? So uh, will not... Well, we can't say will not, it might do, but it's, it doesn't. So it may not cut through the axes. And if I want to do a sort of demonstration, um, what, was her, what were her two uh, values? Um, 4.5 and a positive value. Okay, so I might do something along the lines of... 4.5 positive there and then just sort of show that there's a sort of asymptote like that okay um final question we have uh iterations going on so figure three shows um part of the shows a plot of part of the curve with the equation uh, with f of x is 2 over x minus e to the x plus 2x squared. Show that alpha lies between 1.5 and minus 1. So we need to basically do what uh, Jane did on that last question. So f of minus 1.5 is going to be, now don't be lazy with this because you might lose a mark. So 2 over minus 1.5 um, minus e to the minus 1.5 plus 2 times minus 1.5 squared and that is if i type this in 2 over minus 1.5 minus e to the minus 1.5 and 2 times minus 1.5 squared and that gives me 2.943 dot, 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 5 and so on and f of minus 1 i think was the other value yep f of minus 1 is going to equal 2 over minus 1 minus e to the minus 1 plus 2 minus 1 squared which is now I can just tweak what I've written on my calculator here. Minus 0.36. 7 dot 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 dot. So this is less than zero. This is greater than zero. So we can then conclude as there is a sign change. and f of x is continuous there must be a root in the interval Oops. um minus one minus one I should have minus 1.5 there, really, shouldn't I? Okay. I mean, I could even use curved brackets there, but it doesn't matter. At this stage, so that's A. Let's have a look at B. Um, so, the iterative formula 
uh, x to the n minus 1. Uh, now this, again, one of the easiest questions in the paper, but a lot of people got wrong because they forgot one little element, and that was that negative sign in front of the iteration formula. Okay, so if I uh, use x1 and plug it in, so x2, ooh, whoops, x2 is going to equal the minus the square root of a half e to the minus 1, was it? Yep, yeah, x is minus 1, um, minus 1 over minus 1. If I type that in on my calculator, making sure to put the minus in front of the square root, a half e to the minus 1, minus 1 over minus 1, I get a value of minus 1.088. And then if I change that minus 1 to the answer button on my calculator, so x3 is going to be minus the square root of a half e to the minus 1.088, minus 1 over minus 1.08, dot, 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 dot. Okay, I'm going to use the exact value that's stored on my calculator. I get a value of minus 1.042818, dot, 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 dot. Now what did our question ask? It wants it to 4dp. So this equals minus 1.0. Zero. Oops. Let's rub that out and make it nice and clear because it's my final answer. Zero four two eight to four dp. Okay. C. And oh wait, no, I haven't done part two there. That's I. I need to do part I I I I. Find the, the value of alpha correct to two decimal places. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to carry on. Well, let's just make sure. So alpha relates to the point A where x equals alpha. So that is the negative root. There is a positive root, okay, but alpha does relate to the negative root. So I'm quite happy that if I just carry on with this iteration, it's going to give me that negative root. So I'm just going to, going to button bash for a little bit until it doesn't change that much. Okay, so I'm currently getting minus 1.0578. Yeah, it's not really changing much from there. So if I keep on going, I get minus 1.0578. Uh, which to 2dp is going to be minus 1.06 to 2dp. Now we can move on to c. Right, so um, the value of beta lies in the interval 1.5 to 3. A student takes 3 as her first approximation for beta. Given that f of 3 is minus 1.4189 and f dashed of 3 is minus 8.3078 to 4dp. Apply the newton raphson method once to f of x to obtain a second approximation for beta. Give your answer to 2dp. Okay, so this is the first approximation and we're asked to find a second approximation using the newton raphson Now this is in your formula book, it's here. And thankfully they've given us f dashed of x and they've also given us f of x x and in this case is going to be our first approximation of 3. Okay, so uh, x2, I guess we could say, is going to be 3 minus, now let's just make sure we get everything in the right place, f of x, so we don't want the derivative yet, so uh, minus 1.41. Um, 8, 9 over the derivative, and the derivative was 83078, I think it was 
negative as well. Let's just type that in on our calculator. 3 minus uh, 1.4189 over 8.3078. And that gives me a value of 2.8292. Um, which to 2dp is 2.83. I think that's what the question asked for. Yeah, give your answer to 2dp. So that is the whole paper. Um, I will post this up on um, Classroom. So if you want to see the working and just have a look through it, you can. Um, there you go, 100%.